Welcome to the Growth Cap Podcast, where we chat with CEOs, investors, and other key industry leaders to uncover insights and strategies for accelerating growth and succeeding in business. I'm your host, RJ Lumba. In this episode, we chat with Greg Marsh, the CEO and founder of Kimi, which has disrupted the locksmith industry, becoming the nation's most trusted 24-hour emergency locksmith. The company also has a network of self-service key duplication kiosks located in thousands of retail locations across the country. Greg shares his insights into the evolution of Kimi, his entrepreneurial journey, and the massive potential that lies ahead for the company. Kimi is growing rapidly and has raised over $150 million from top-tier investors, including Battery Ventures, BlackRock, Brentwood, Comcast Ventures, and others. We hope you enjoy the show. Greg, so great to see you again. You know, it's been several years since we first met and I'm happy to see all the progress you've made with the business. Would love to start out with your biggest challenge as an entrepreneur. That's a big one. When I look back, so I started the company about nine years ago and I look back at all the, probably the biggest challenges and biggest mistakes I've made. The top couple are all people related. Yeah, you know, people are everything for for a business, and especially one that's evolving and learning and growing and dealing with all sorts of challenges. And um, it's just being able to better assess having the right people in the right places for kind of where where we're headed. Those those have been I've come to appreciate eighty to ninety percent of what I need to get right to make sure that we're you know going to be really successful. But that that certainly stands out as probably where most of the the challenges and mistakes I've made uh, come from. You're tackling a really interesting problem. It's one that anyone could encounter, and that they got locked out of their car or their house. When we think about technology, we don't typically think about key making or key duplication. Tell us how you think about the business in the context of you know tech entrepreneurship. Locksmith industry is about a fifty billion dollar year industry globally. Twelve of that's in the U.S. And you know, as you mentioned, people don't really think a whole lot about this about this industry or the problem. It's been very ignored by technology sophisticated operators. That's a large part of why we find it so intriguing and think there's such a big opportunity. But the technology largely has not changed in a hundred plus years. And despite being a $12 billion industry, has extreme fragmentation. The average locksmith is rated 2.1 out of 5 on Google Maps. It has the worst experience rating of any large offline service industry I'm aware of. You've got some great locksmiths, but you also have a lot of really fraudulent kind of bad actors as well. And so all that combined, we believe there is a tremendously large opportunity for us to come in with technology to really improve the customer experience, create scalable cost advantages that are challenging to to replicate and really build a moat, and build the first ever brand in the industry that consistent customer experience. And if we can deliver that great experience millions or tens of millions of times, we believe we're going to be the brand, the first ever brand, that when people need keys or they're locked out or they need some kind of locksmith service, Kimi is the company they think of. And they're associating us with great, you know, experience and great prices, and that's that's sort of the magical outcome that we're we're headed towards. But it's an extremely large, ignored offline service. And help me think about this. So I can name probably one or maybe two times that I've locked myself out. So it's not necessarily, from my perspective, recurring. At least me as a customer. I mean, you just mentioned this is a huge market. You know, in what context, I guess, is it huge? <laughs> yeah, well, in, in terms of spend, but we have, you know, I would say, generally speaking, a relatively low LTV, right? A good customer to us, you know, maybe uses us once a year, but we have millions and millions of customers coming to us. And, and so we have a couple parts of the business. On key duplication, you have about a billion keys with a B being made every year. Most of that historically has been made in brick and mortar with store associates making those keys. And with labor rates and you know the error rates of that process and just how competitive brick and mortar is, it is now negative margin for a human to make a key in a brick and mortar retail environment. You're typically losing 20 to 30 cents for every single key that you make in a store. 
And so you have these billions of keys that are migrating towards self-service, which we think is a very favorable trend for us. So there's a lot of keys being made. It is not a frequent purchase on a per person basis, but there's lots of people who move and need, need keys. And so it's a large number of people who are making these purchases. And then on the locksmith side, we're becoming the largest destination for emergency locksmith services nationally. Most people are locked out of their homes or locked out of their cars and they need someone to help them. And so this also doesn't happen with frequency on a per person basis, but it happens to a very large portion of the population. Got it. So is that the majority of the business now is, you know, in terms of like revenue breakout, would you find the business kind of being more substantial on the locksmith service side? And is the growth trajectory on that end also, you know, a bit more pronounced? Certainly growing quickly. So yeah, you know, a couple, five years ago, the entire business was key making activity from our kiosk. And that still is growing very well. We're in about 5,000 retail locations right now. We're growing very rapidly. We hope to be in more than 10,000, you know, within the next two years or so. But this emergence of a locksmith services part of the business is growing very rapidly. We see a ton of value there. And what's really exciting from our perspective is the combination of this high quality locksmith technician network that we're building around where we actually have kiosks. And we're getting a lot of people, you know, tens of millions of people are interacting with our kiosks in retail environments. How can we offer beyond key duplication, lots of other services they might want, home services, locksmith services that can be you know, scheduled and booked at the, at the kiosk. And that combination of the technician network and the, the in-store kiosk presence, we think is very powerful and there's a lot of synergies there. Got it. And then when you think about the future of keys and as folks move to more other solutions, you know, whether it be like a keypad or some other, you know, method of locking and, and unlocking, do you see kind of Kimi expanding into other areas? Yeah, for sure. So brass keys will go away at some point. It'll take a while. And to kind of quantify that, the reason brass keys have not changed in literally, you know, the last 50, 100 years is because the average cycle time for your typical door lock is about 30-ish years, 30, 35 years. You look at vehicle keys, vehicle keys have changed very rapidly over the last decade or so. And that's because the cycle time for a car is, you know, three years, four years. It's a tenth of what the, the residential lock is. So when you look at the adoption rates necessary to really start to move the needle for the brass key market under astronomical assumptions where... You know, today, every new home build gets rid of a physical key and you know, there's, there's retrofits at high rates, even under extremely aggressive assumptions like that. You know, in like 10 years, we're looking at probably, you know, mid to high single digit percent impact to, to brass key markets. And those are very aggressive assumptions. So I believe there's a couple of decades where brass keys could be a highly attractive market. That said, we would like to accelerate the trend away from brass keys. So we don't ever envision ourselves making door hardware, digital locks and, and things of that nature. It's a tough business. There's definitely going to be a couple of very successful players. There already are some emerging, but it, it's a tough, tough business. Doors change a lot. They're not standardized. Making a lock that can go into all this different types of hardware, the good experience and work reliably is not an easy task. So, but where we view our, our value prop is we have tens of millions of customers most of them just moved who are making keys with us. How can we use that, that engagement opportunity we have with them to promote really compelling, great locks and other kind of equipment that they're likely to be looking for anyway for these new homes that they just purchased? And so we see ourselves as being a powerful kind of distribution layer, given the interaction we have with, with all these consumers. And then with our technician network of locksmiths, we're a logistics layer too. A lot of these locks require some technical knowledge to be able to install them seamlessly. And we can make that experience really, really good. Some of these locks have very high uh, return rates purely just because of the installation process itself. And by making that really easy, you know, we're solving a powerful problem too. So no matter how you slice it, brass keys will be here. They'll go away at some point. But yeah, digital keys have a lot of advantages or digital locks should say have a lot of advantages. And, and we want to, you know, make sure we're, we're a really compelling part of that, that kind of trend. I've noticed you've raised quite a bit of money. Tell us about that process and the investors you have now, as well as the um, the value that they've provided 
beyond financial capital? We're capital intensive business, which, you know, generally investors are allergic to hardware. And so there's, you know, truth to, to why that is, right? Hardware generally requires a lot more capital in the early stage of the business when things are less proven. There's a lot more technical risk. The scaling profile of a hardware based company tends to be much more linear than exponential. So, like, there's good reasons why investors tend to shy away from, from hardware. On the flip side, there are some major benefits to hardware companies, right? Like once you actually achieve success and, and some level of scale, there's really big kind of barriers to entry that, that give that company power. There's generally a much more clear path to large scale, even though it might not be like Facebook exponential, you can really draw pretty high confidence lines to very large kind of markets. So all that said, yeah, we've, we've had to raise a good amount of money to fund the, the capex in the business. BlackRock is our largest investor, followed by Brentwood, Comcast, Battery Ventures, and Questmark. So we've been really fortunate to, to have an amazing group of investors. And you know, if you would ask me when we're first starting the company, what I thought those investors would, would bring would be you know, introductions and, and their network. And all that's certainly valuable to us. But really, the most valuable thing I've gotten out of our investor base, out of our board, is going into discussions with a you know two or three things that are really important strategically for the direction we're going in terms of how we're going to build this company, and coming out of those board meetings or discussions with a different opinion on you know one or two things because of that dialogue and being challenged by really smart people with different perspectives, and so that's that's what I've come to most value from from an investor is just having someone who can help me think smartly about how to build this business and challenge me in really productive ways to make sure we're, you know, not overlooking things or that we're, you know, we're not making stupid decisions. Mm -hmm. Well, what's one thing that you never anticipated, you know, as you were founding the business, I mean, clearly you've, you know, made some adjustments in the approach, but anything like surprising along the way that, you know, where you sit today and you look back and you, you kind of say, never would have imagined that we'd be kind of in this line of business or doing or approaching it this way? Yeah, all sorts of stuff. I mean, some things that we thought would be wildly successful were humongous failures. So in the very early stages, the companies had a, a, a key delivery service where we would actually physically deliver a key that you had saved. So if you store a key digitally to your account and you get locked out, we basically in New York, if you ordered it, we would cut a key based on that digital information you saved and messenger it to your location in New York City. The demand was actually pretty good, but the logistics were insanely difficult and expensive and just didn't work. So like that was something we thought would be one of the biggest parts of our of our growth in the early days. And it turned out to be a, a complete failure. So like that's one end. And then on the other side, things that we didn't even contemplate beyond kind of making making keys like this technician network that we have of providing all these locks and services, you know, have kind of hit us over the head in terms of being such big opportunities. And there were things that we certainly did not plan on at the inception of the business. So it kind of works both ways. You know, when you're, when you're doing something really new and innovative, you know, you're, you're a fool if you think you, you know, what's going to work or not. And you just need to as rapidly as possible validate that what you think is important and that you want to spend resources on is is actually appreciated by customers and, and works. And, um, you know, we've done a reasonably good job of that. And, and that's led us to figuring out that some things we thought were great are not great. And some things that we didn't even consider are actually much more valuable than we ever, you know, thought originally. Mm -hmm. And how expensive was it to launch the, the locksmith service versus the key duplication? I mean, the digital key image duplication. There's a couple of ways to look at it. So, you know, the, the kiosk has a big R&D component, which is expensive in terms of like designing and building and, you know, using third parties to, to manufacture. With the delivery service, we didn't really have any of that. We, you know, and I would cut these keys and we'd work with delivery folks. So like the actual CapEx to run that was not very difficult. The more expensive part was just team focus, right? You've got runway that's precious and you've got a team that needs to be focused and it's really the, the distraction cost. That's the biggest cost of doing something like that. So once it was clear it wasn't working, being really objective and making that decision and shutting it down is, is so important and, and not kind of, you know, having this 
like sunk cost fallacy where you're just trying to make it work, even though all the signals are are telling you the opposite. Like that's that's what is a really important kind of um, I think attribute to have as a, as a leader to make sure that you're being really good in taking the information you have today and and objectively looking at how the company is focused and resourced. And and it can piss people off too, right? Where people work real hard on a product, they get really excited about it. And it just doesn't work. And there's lots of emotional reasons to want to continue to invest and double down and try and figure it out. And sometimes that's the right decision. Oftentimes it's not. And it's much better to pull the plug and take some short-term pain and really refocus on where you're going to be successful. Mm -hmm. And where do you see the business heading? Like what's your ultimate goal with it? That ultimate goal could be either, you know, near term, midterm. Long term, just curious how you how you're thinking about the business today. Yeah, we we want to build the first brand. So what success looks like for us is if you need a key or you're locked out, you need some kind of locks and service. We are the national brand that everyone in America is thinking about. That they know they're going to get a great experience and they're going to get a reasonable price, and that's that's what we want. And if that occurs, we're going to be a dominant part of this twelve billion dollar year. U.S. industry, like it's just, it's such a big, big opportunity that no one's been thinking about, and so that's what gets us excited. Is how can we get better in terms of the experience we're delivering and deliver incremental services that our customers want and our retailers need to make sure that we're, um, you know, we're, we're continuing to be on that on that path. Mm-hmm. And I'm uh, eyeing the clock here. We're coming up on on time, and there's typically a couple questions I'd like to ask at the end. One is, can you tell us about a leader, and it could be business or in another field, that uh, you know you really think highly of and, and you try to emulate in one way or another? Yeah, there's a guy who is super influential when I started the company. So the Jens Malbach, who's the founder of Coinstar, which then owned Redbox and became a public company called Outer Wall. When I was first starting the business, I cold reached out to him. He gets a bunch of people with kiosk concepts reaching out to him all the time, and I was able to get him on the phone and he's off the charts smart and obviously knows kiosk businesses very well. So like, you know, really peppered me with, uh, with, with some questions, but I was able to impress him a little bit and we got him engaged and became an investor and board member. And he pushed me in many uncomfortable ways in the early days of the business, because he asked really good questions that should have been asked. And when you're at least a first time founder, you want so badly for things to work and oftentimes that can cloud the objectiveness of asking really difficult questions of, is this working or not? Or like, is this the right approach or not? Or trying to sugarcoat a problem that maybe is a lot more fundamental than you're giving it credit to. And um, he's just an amazing leader and he's got great instincts on where to focus. And, and he, he pushed me on lots of things that helped make us you know, avoid some humongous mistakes in the early days that could have prevented us from being here today and made sure that we were focused on on really important things to deliver a great experience. But yeah, Ann Smallback is, uh, is an amazing guy and a um, ton of respect for him and gratitude for, for helping us out in the early days. And last question, and this is actually a new one that we don't typically ask, but is there a, a book that has had, I guess, more impact on your life than, than other books you read? Something that, that kind of stands out as something that's influenced you in a really positive way? I mean, this is kind of a generic answer, but I love this book. Is uh, Hard Things by Hard Things? No, the Andreessen book, which yes. I'm switching the title of. Like when you read that, he clearly went through such such crazy roller coaster rides and had to do such difficult decisions in terms of product and team. And you know, reading that book both helps almost feel like there's someone you can relate to in terms of like, oh wow, someone's laid out some really difficult things that I can relate to in some shape or form, but also reinforcing conviction on when you have to do really difficult things, especially when they're people related or product related, like the importance of being disciplined and making difficult decisions as a leader to make sure that the, the company is going to be successful. But yeah. Hard things about hard things, Ben Horowitz. Well, I'm, I'm butchering, butchering the title, but yeah, it's, um, it's a fantastic book. How big is uh, Kimi now in terms of employees? We are about 225 uh, team members, so reasonable size. It's funny, I was talking to someone the other day of 
how we, we don't like that metric in terms of valuing success. Like our goal is to have the fewest number of people and be as big as possible and efficient as possible. We don't want to empire build and have some humongous team. We want to build a huge company through technology and where um, individuals can really be hyper impactful in their in their roles. So uh, yeah, we're we're about there and we'll continue to grow. You know, obviously our our team size has the company scales, but uh, distributed, uh, remote, or in person, or a mix. We're effectively remote. We we have a, a Kentucky warehouse that's full steam. Where we're doing lots of operational work in terms of if a product's going to go in the mail or we're staging kiosks to um to go out in the field or, or sending them back to the reverse supply chain. But aside from that, we're we're mostly remote. We do have an office in the New Jersey area, but I'm I'm now actually in Colorado, and we're um you know lots of our leadership is across the across the country, so we're we're remote. Yeah, awesome. In Denver or Boulder? I'm out in Boulder. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Greg, great to see you. You look as youth, youthful as you did, you know, five, six years ago. I doubt um, that. I doubt that. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for spending the time and uh, best of luck. Again, really appreciate it. Thanks so much, RJ. I appreciate it.